Good morning, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to our side event today, Saving Energy, Saving Lives, Energy Efficiency as a Climate Unifier. My name is Laura Tierney, and I'm Vice President of International Programs at the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, and I'll be your moderator today. Um, by way of brief introduction, the Business Council for Sustainable Energy is a trade association representing the broad and diverse portfolio of clean energy and energy efficiency solutions. Our work is to advocate for policies that accelerate the deployment of these solutions at home and abroad. And here at COP, we are working to demonstrate how our businesses are reducing emissions, building resilience, and growing economies. So why are we here? We want to feed into the positive ambition loop at COP sharing what can be done, what is being done in the real economy, and what more can be done with greater public-private partnership, all in the name of spurring greater country ambition to address climate. And really, what a better place, this is the best place to tell that story at the America's All In Action Center. Um, and we're, that brings together and convenes subnational leaders committed to climate action. So I know that this span, this particular panel exemplifies this spirit. Today we are bringing to you thought leaders from the policy, private sector, and academic realms that all have deep expertise and special knowledge about a central, if not unsung, tool in our climate action toolbox, energy efficiency. We call it EE for short. Um, but so I hope this title has you uh, curious about what we're going to talk about today. I'm pretty sure that you all know a thing or two about energy efficiency yourselves. For example, IEA believes that energy efficiency can get us about halfway to the Paris Agreement goals. And hopefully you've heard about the call to triple renewable energy capacity and to at least double the rate of energy efficiency by 2030 to enable us to get on track, back on track to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. And last, I know, I mean, I know everybody knows a little bit about energy efficiency and how it impacts your daily lives and how you manage your energy con consumption at home and where you live. But I should, I should stop talking because this panel, this is the panel that actually knows is going to tell you a lot about energy efficiency. And we're so lucky to have them here today. Uh, one house host keeping uh, aside. So we're, this panel is going to talk to you for about 40 minutes. And then we're really pleased to host uh, Dave Turk, U.S. Deputy Secretary of Energy, for a fireside chat for the final, the closing of the meeting. So welcome to our panel. Um, we have... Uh, starting in the pink at the end, we have uh, Helen Walter Terranoni, Director of Global Climate Policy for Train Technologies. Uh, to her left, Paula Glover, President of the Alliance to Save Energy. To her left, Dr. Destiny Nock, Assistant Professor of Engineering and Public Policy and Civil and en Environmental Engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. She has some other titles, she'll tell you about that. And then to her left, we have Bob Hinkle, Founder and Executive Chairman of Metris Energy. So, I'm going to ask them to give a, a short self-introduction to start and tell us a bit more about where they land in this great uh, energy efficiency ecosystem. So I'll start and we'll go reverse order. Paul, uh, Bob. Yeah. Yeah. Up here. yeah, well, excited to be here on the panel. So uh, Bob Hinkle with Metris Energy. Metris is a developer, financer, and an owner of larger scale energy efficiency and sustainable energy projects. We finance and implement projects for commercial, industrial, and manufacturing firms, but also schools and hospitals. Every project that we fund is climate positive, which means that we're reducing scope one, scope two emissions for our customers. And we're a proud member of uh, America's All In. And earlier today, as part of uh, the Mission Efficiency Organization and their call to action and pledge, we doubled our existing investment commitment under America's All In from 200 million to 400 million. So we're excited about that. And as Laura was talking about earlier, the doubling of energy efficiency at, here at COP as a COP level goal is our inspiration for that. So we're we're hoping to do our part on that and uh, excited uh, for the panel. Hi everyone, my name is Destiny Nock and I, my main role is being a professor at Carnegie Mellon. Um, so there my research focuses on energy transitions and how much energy people are using in their homes. 
Uh, one of the things my research has shown is that even when you control for house size and the actual appliances in the home, low-income groups wait five to seven degrees longer than high-income groups just to turn on their air conditioning systems. Now that highlights an inequity um, within the ability to actually use energy once you even have an energy efficient appliance. And in the winter time, we actually see the opposite effect. So when we did our study in Chicago with over 100,000 homes, we saw that low income groups turned on their heating systems eight to 10 degrees earlier than high income groups, most likely due to lack of insulation in their homes. Um, and so we also know that people are more heat tolerant than cold tolerant. You can leave your house when it's super hot outside because it's during the middle of the day, everything's open. When it's cold, you just know you're cold. <laughs> and you know the reason is because your heat's probably not on or not working, right? Um, so then from that work, we spun that out into a startup company out of Carnegie Mellon, so I'm the CEO of People's Energy Analytics, where we actually use the actual household energy data to understand are people at risk of their pipes freezing in their home, are they at risk of heat strokes in their home, and what value and benefit can energy efficient appliances bring um, to these homeowners, given their incomes, their ages, and a bunch of other demographics. And then my last title that I'll say, I have some other ones, but just not to overwhelm you, I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer of DevStream, which is focused on monetizing and developing environmental and social assets. So one of the things is business people say, how does that affect my bottom line? And so then we use a lot of metrics to actually monetize the benefit that you bring to a community. So you can see in my research, I do metrics. And all the startup companies, I also do metrics because I want to know how close or far away are we from people living a better life. Good morning, everybody. My name is Paula Glover, and I'm with the Alliance to Save Energy. We are a US-based coalition of industry, businesses, government, academia, um, other nonprofit organizations, trade associations, and environmental groups. And we only focus on federal advocacy around energy efficiency. Um, we have made a commitment as an organization back several years ago to really be focused on equity, using an equity lens through all of our work. Um, and so we think about efficiency in a way that says, how are we able to make sure that every single American household and business is able to have access to and adopt efficiency technology? So that leads you to affordability, um, access to um, enabling technologies, um, passive efficiency in terms of whether or not you have the kind of building envelope that's going to allow you to adopt the newer technologies. Um, but we really do believe that unless all of us are able to adopt it, and that doesn't mean that it's sitting in the store and if you have the money you can buy it, but that we are actually really able to adopt it, um, we're not going to reach these climate goals. Uh, so I'm uh, Helen Walter Terranoni, and I'm the director of uh, uh, global climate policy at Train Technologies. So in case you've never heard of Train Technologies, we are the largest manufacturer of heating and cooling equipment uh, globally. Um, and we lead in our commitment around um, decarbonization and, and sustainability. Uh, we have um, science-based targets uh, all the way through net zero. Uh, and we have recently be ha been hailed as um, as a leader in our credibility around our policy work uh, around climate. Um, and that's important because we see a lot of uh, the other side of that um, in this space. Um, <clears throat> train technologies uh, beyond that, we also have a gigaton challenge. So uh, by 2030, we have committed to reduce the emissions from our customers by a billion tons of CO2. And uh, uh, we, uh, we span the space uh, in the cold chain, so for food and vaccines, uh, as well as for buildings, so chillers and air conditioning, homes, uh, the entire space, <clears throat> as well as uh, very, very cold temperature uh, vaccines and industrial processing. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, we, um, we think about uh, energy efficiency as the unifier in a couple of different ways. Uh, one of them is that uh, for all of us, uh, as we move toward electrification policies and electrification actions, we will need much more electricity production. We will need less if we are more efficient in, in the way that we uh, use our energy. This is great from a many different ways. One is the cost of that, but also, um, I don't know if you've heard of something called peaker plants. So those, those are peak electricity plants that are kind of started up and shut down and started up and shut down when there's a peak demand. So in the summertime, during the day, in the wintertime at night. 
Um, that is a bit of a dirty process. Um, uh, there are more emissions and pollution from those peaker plants. And so uh, we also think about load shifting. Um, so how can we shift those loads so we have less of those peaker plants uh, going up and down? Um, uh, as well as um, thinking about um, uh, the energy efficiency itself. So, um, so all of those things, as well as um, uh, we'll talk more about load and other exciting topics here in a minute with Laura. So. Thank you. Thank you for doing that introductory, you know, uh, explanation of how, where our power comes from and why the surges in demand in these extreme weather situations really impact, you know, human health. And Destiny talked to it a bit and through her research as well. You know, we have to be more aware of, of, of how different households approach the consumption and use of their energy and the impact. Mm -hmm. It really is. I mean, this is not just a clickbait kind of title, saving energy, saving lives. Like this is, this is it's, it's real. And, I'm, and thank you all for bringing in the, the health benefits and the, the, human, the human touch points as well, because I think that's probably the most powerful part of energy efficiency as a climate action tool, is that we all have an association with it, right? It's not something that has to, well, these people, the companies are building the solutions that help us not think about it, right? To digitize these solutions and build the systems. Um, we work together to build the policies that enable it. Um, so thank you for kicking off the why, 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 is, why do we think of energy efficiency as the superhuman or the superhero unifier? So let, let, I want to let the others jump in. So I'm not going to go in lines back and forth, you know, well, whoever I'll wants start. to start. I mean, I think to your point, Laura, Right. Oftentimes when we talk about these issues, we don't think about the person at the end of the technology. And I think what we're trying to get to is that no matter what decisions we make, there is a person who is impacted by that decision making. Um, and, it, and I'll just give you guys a very brief story, I think, to, to make my point. Um, before I joined the Alliance, I was at another association called the American Association of Blacks and Energy. And I had a member who called me really, really excited because he was finally able to install a new HVAC system in the home of an 88-year-old woman who lived in Atlanta and who had not had access to heat or air for 18 years. So think about our elders. What's the weather like there in Georgia? Do you know what I mean, yeah. right? So in the summer for 17 years, she had no air. But in the winter, she had no heat, right? And so the ability to literally change this woman's life allow her to age in place, keep her home, keep that family's wealth, all of that was effectuated just by a furnace, right? Just by a system. Um, and so I, I just, I share that so that we understand that the work that we do is really, really important and it's meaningful at the most base level because I think we assume that everybody lives the way that we live and the reality is that most people don't live the way that we live. And just to jump on that point, so, you know, one of the challenges with trying to find people that don't live the way we live is no one wants to jump up and say, hey, I'm really poor, can you give me some stuff, right? right? Like, nobody wants to say that. Yeah. Um, and I think that one of the things that I recently realized is how we target people for these energy efficiency deployments oftentimes has to do with how much you spend on your bills. If you spend a lot of money on your bills, then the utility will target you saying like, hey, to reduce your bill, how about we sign you up? But when I was living in Massachusetts, we used to cut off our heat when we would leave to go to work so we would save money, right? And then eventually our landlord came into the house to do a, a random check and she found the heat off and she said, if all the pipes freeze, you're liable and you will get kicked out. So we're like, okay, well let's make sure we turn on that heat. Um, so then we turned on our heat instead of paying our electricity bill because we couldn't afford both at the time. And then we got our electricity disconnected and as an electrical engineer, I quickly learned that the heating doesn't work if your thermostat doesn't work, right? And that was, you know, like just mind blowing, right? Because you think of it as the light bill. You don't think of it as your heating, food refrigeration, water pumping bill. <laughs> um, and so then when I think about, you know, what is energy efficiency, it's also allowing people that are currently putting themselves at risk of losing their house, putting themselves at risk of heat stroke in the summer to be able to adapt to climate change. Right, so not only is it a climate mitigation unifier, it's also a climate adaptation um, unifier. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, I'm hoping that using electricity data to find these people, I mean, there are certain signals that you can see if somebody's never 
increasing their energy usage over the entire summer, I can guarantee you they don't have an AC, right? And so when we were doing our study in Arizona, they had a survey they deployed to all their customers saying, do you have one, two, or three ACs? They didn't ask if you had none. They didn't ask if it was broken, right? And so then we actually said, well, 3% of your population has none. Um, so then now you can actually target differently to say these people should get heat pumps, these people should um, get energy efficient technologies. So the data helps you identify the communities that aren't raising their hand, uh, screaming loudly that exactly. they need help. Bob. Well, I add on maybe two other Ps. Uh, energy efficiency as a unifier is certainly key for people, but also projects and the planet. In terms of how we think about energy efficiency, really at its core, it's a combination of a wide range of different technologies, electric and thermal, that if you look at their impact in a, in a disparate way, they can be small, but collectively the power is significant. And we can see that in our portfolio of projects where a typical project will have six or seven energy efficiency measures that get bundled together, and that leads to added scale, added impact for people. Um, so energy efficiency just has that natural unifier of bringing together a wide range of technologies. And then for the planet side, Laura, you were talking about how the IEA's uh, statement that 40% of the emissions that could get us to the Paris Agreement target reductions would come from energy efficiency. So if you look at the impact that energy efficiency can have across different markets, different geographies, and pull people together, it's, it's a powerful unifier on that front too. Laura, can I yeah. jump in? Uh, yeah. So I'm going to tell you a story because that's my favorite thing to do. Um, my mom moved in with me uh, right before the pandemic, right before the quarantine started, and uh, we had just um, we had just kind of saved our pennies and built a room on the house for her. Um, excitingly enough, for some reason, that room was freezing cold. We couldn't figure it out. Uh, we learned uh, uh, into the winter that they had uh, forgotten to insulate above the room. So that was exciting. Our energy bill, our heating bill was $7,000 for that because of that. Of course, it's much lower now that we figured all that out, right? $7,000. Um, load reduction through good insulation of buildings through uh, coatings on roofs and other passive cooling. All of those things are so important and we can't have that discussion with talking about reducing loads uh, and passive cooling. Um, if you look around the Expo Center here, there are so many um, well-designed features. You can see um, the screening over the walkways and uh, you see trees and very, very clever solutions uh, for passive cooling. Um, doesn't make my company any money, I don't care. We need to decarbonize the world and we're not gonna get there unless we do this. Um, but reducing those loads and passive cooling, these are all things for the future and part of the energy efficiency story that we need to think about. Thank you for bringing it back to the Expo Center because we dialed in very, we quite narrowly down to the room of your mother, right? And now can we broaden the aperture, ap how do you say that, aperture? Mm -hmm of um, to look at, you know, the expo. Can you, uh, Bob, can you tell us a little bit about the commercial, you know, build, you know, the projects, a little bit more about the projects, how we broaden that out to commercial buildings, uh, you know, cities? Yeah, so energy efficiency, I think, is unique in its power to positively shape the future, and I think it's unique among the different climate investment opportunities. But to do that, it's gonna require, in the commercial industrial sector, added flexibility of financing solutions. And that really means treating energy efficiency as the resource that it is, a valuable resource that should be put on par with supply side energy. At Metris, how we're trying to do that is through our energy as a service solution where for commercial industrial manufacturing firms, we fund 100% of the upfront cost of a project own the energy efficiency assets and then bill customers based on measured energy savings or the delivery of sustainable cooling and heating. And we see that as significant because it can unlock the potential for energy savings within the built environment. It also allows for bundling together different project opportunities together where 
you might have some project equipment upgrades that have a shorter payback, some that have a longer payback, but bundling them together allows to do energy efficiency at a greater speed and scale. But getting back to a little bit of the benefits of energy efficiency, I think the industry has made a bit of a mistake of focusing too heavily just on energy savings and thinking about the, re the reductions on that side and not thinking about the broader benefits of energy efficiency. And we see that particularly becoming important in cooling and heating, where certainly sustainable cooling and heating has efficiency gains. There are energy savings. But if you look at it from a financial perspective, those projects often have a payback period of 30 or 40 years, which makes them, from a financing perspective, very challenging. And these are capital-intensive, critical upgrades that, as we're talking about, have direct human impacts, whether it's on worker productivity or health and safety, um, you know, significant benefits. So how we're looking to expand upon that is to bill based on the available cooling or heating that is there from a project. So instead of billing on energy savings, billing on tons of cooling that are available on BTU of heating. And that, I think, will open up some of these more significant benefits, which, which are real and tangible. There's a study that came out recently focusing in on the US that was looking more at the lens of productivity. And it was talking about how as temperatures soar and get towards 100 degrees Fahrenheit, that worker productivity and student learning can fall off by as much as 70%. And that's just on the productivity side of it. It's not getting into the health side. So I think as energy efficiency looks to, to 2030 and the goals of doubling, I think it's also getting to some of the, the broader base benefits of efficiency that are important. Great. So. Um Innovative financing tools are really critical to helping us move faster on this deployment towards our decarbonization goals, our midterm goal of 2030, long-term goal of 2050. Um, floor is open for other thoughts on how, what, what more is needed between now and 2030. So in terms of the, I'll speak on the financing and then maybe on the policy side. So on the financing side, that's one of the reasons why I joined DevStream because we are a technology-based startup that focuses on monetizing environmental assets. So if a company wants to invest in energy-efficient technologies, but they don't have the upfront capital, then what DevStream does is they actually bring the upfront capital, but in exchange for the carbon reduction credits, right? And so actually trying to find a way to use like voluntary carbon reductions to help monetize some of these upfront costs and try to get over the hump of that 30-year waiting time for that payback period is something that I do believe is necessary because if you look at you know any of the households that want to invest in energy efficiency, that upfront cost matters a lot. I mean, for a renter, they're not going to want to invest $30,000 in a property that they don't even know if they'll live in for the next five years, right? And so finding a way to disaggregate the actual like live occupants of the building from the owners and the people that benefit from the building, I think is one of the challenges um, for doing like an energy efficiency transition. Um, and then when we think broadly about cities, you know, our government transitioning, I do think that we really have to be critical about the policies that we use to incentivize energy efficiency adoption. Um, so I'll give you an example from Pennsylvania. It's Act 129, which says electric and gas utilities legally cannot encourage anyone to use more energy. So what does this mean for energy efficiency? It sounds good, right? Because you have to encourage people to use less. But then I went to the utility and I told them, there's a lot of people that don't have ACs, so we really should deploy heat pumps. Oh. And so then they say, well, I actually can't encourage anyone who doesn't have an AC to get a heat pump because that will encourage them to use more energy and this is bad for energy efficiency. And I was like, hold up. From an engineering perspective, energy efficiency, the actual definition is using less energy for the same quality of life. But you now with giving them ACs, you have improved their quality of life. But uh, Pennsylvania is not the only place that has deemed a heat pump deployment ineffective. So I work with another nonprofit in Ohio that partnered with Duke Energy to deploy heat pumps as well. And then they also said it was a failure because everyone increased their electricity bill. And I said, well, we're the ones that increased our electricity bill in the summer. And did they have ACs? And they were like, oh, yeah, that's probably what happened. <laughs> and so when we think about how we're designing policies to encourage energy efficiency adoption, it really is critical to not forget those health impacts that we talked about at the beginning, but figuring out a way to try to incentivize utilities to use less. And I think a part of that can come at the commercial 
sector, but when we think about residents, we do have to take a lot of care on how we're gonna do that. I think I, I want to just add, I think, as we think about the deployment of efficiency, and we talk a lot about um, right, improvement in, in, of our transmission grid so that we can adopt more technologies and shift load and all of these things, um, but we do not talk about the distribution grid. And I think the, the quiet, dirty secret is that our distribution grid, certainly in the U.S., in most places, can't actually adopt the load of a charging station today. And so we are way out ahead of ourselves when we're talking about building new transmission because it actually will not matter if we, don't, if we can't get to the distribution lines. And efficiency is actually a way to reduce that um, and provide the kind of resilience that we really need. And so all of these things are, I think, deeply connected. Um, and to Destiny's point, I think we should think about the tools that we use to encourage people um, to adopt technologies and things because in some ways, it's a little bit tone deaf. Um, we, we silo our policy um, decisions without really thinking about who consumers are, and I'll, I'll give you an example. When we're doing rebats, rebates for appliances, if they are not point of service rebates, they actually do not work, right? So you can't say, I'm gonna give you a rebate for a new furnace and it's gonna be $10,000 but I need you to buy the furnace, get it installed, and then I'll send you your $10,000. Um, most people would be like, oh, well, yes, I'm not getting that. And so we do have to think, I think, if this is um, build policy with outcomes in mind, that's how I would phrase it, right? And I don't think we actually build policy with outcomes in mind, and if we do, we certainly don't measure the success of our policies based on the real outcome at the end of the day. We kind of say, this is my intent, here's where we go, and if it doesn't work, it's kind of like, oh, well, in 10 years when we start thinking about it again, we'll come up with some new stuff, and that just is not the way that we're gonna get there. Right, and especially here, 10 years to mm -hmm. try again, scratch, and, and, yeah, and I mean, build the policy again is not, it's not gonna meet, meet, it's not gonna put us where we need to be. Yeah. Helen, come on. So, so uh, you know, I'm a glass half full kind of person. <laughs> Had you noticed that? Um, um, uh, and I think um, I'm a very excited about what I see in the US and Ghana and other nations around clever policies to advance efficient, the adoption of efficient equipment as well as decarbonized equipment. Um, if I look at the U.S., uh, the, the IRA and IIJA, there's, they're, uh, they're about to launch funding out in the U.S. for uh, the adoption of heat pumps as well as uh, uh, load reduction, so insulation and deep decarbonization of homes and rental properties. It's a very exciting time. But if I look across the world in Ghana, um, I heard yesterday about a, a policy that they have that they've kind of tested out with um, banks, where the bank, if you if you have an income and you get kind of a monthly paycheck deposited in your bank account, uh, then you they will front you the money for a new energy efficient appliance, kind of equal to an uh, Energy Star ish program or kind of a starred uh, program, uh, and then they they take the money every month to kind of pay for that. And as I mentioned before, with my seven thousand dollar story, right. Um, Energy efficiency and load reduction are money savers, and that's money that goes back in the pockets of families, right? Families that need that money. Um, and so, uh, you know, that type of program, um, Destiny, uh, fascinating example that you gave for the utilities, but there are thousands of utility programs. Um, I think that in many cases, some of those policies were developed like don't make it worse kind of policies that did make it worse. Um, well before we kind of needed air conditioning so much in Pennsylvania, right? And so we do need to have the thought process that we may have to go back and revisit some of those things once we've learned that there's some unintended consequences. But there are some very clever things being done, and um, um, I just challenged uh, some folks this morning. They need to get all this on a website so everybody with local governments, national governments, internationally, people can go and find these and share these excellent practices. So um, I'm hoping that's gonna come to fruition, so. Yeah, and I just wanted to add one thing too. When we're thinking about policies, Paula, you mentioned silos, right? And so 
for me, I like to do like poverty immersion research. So I have a rental property with two low income tenants. And one of them actually ended up getting her, like, her pipes froze because she was using so little energy. So I was like, oh, history repeats itself, right? But then we were like, oh, well, this is a perfect time since, I mean, she did have to leave, but um, this is a perfect time to insulate the whole house. We'll change out all the wires and we'll do all that, those things. Well, I don't qualify myself, right, for those utility programs. But I was like, well, this is a low income tenant. Like, I'm going to get another one in. I already have an agreement with the um, housing voucher program. But then they said, no, you, like unless the tenant is living there, then you can't apply for any of these programs. And so then I was like, I really wish that we could partner our energy utilities with our low income housing programs to actually just, I would sign an agreement, right? Like, hey, if you guys want to pay for this, I will gladly sign up. And so really thinking about how do we link these different policies that exist to try to make them more efficient and more effective to get at the renters, the people that you know probably won't be able to buy those rebates uh, won't be able to last for the rebates and things. And I think that that is one way that we can also make better use of like the IRA funds, the IIJA funds as well. Yeah. I just, I want to just add to your glasses half full <laughs> um, that energy efficiency is also, I would say the great economic driver. Yeah. It's the great economic driver. It is the sector of the industry that we all can be involved in no matter where we live, right? No matter what our educational level is, there's an economic opportunity there. Um, and we see in the talks at COP and any kinds of negotiations that we do end up having to have a conversation about the economy. Like that is a big piece of the discussion and efficient, and it doesn't matter your fuel source. It's not efficiency and electricity. It's also efficiency and gas. It's efficiency if you're using oil. It's efficiency and water. Um, and so we have such a great economic story to tell that when you have mass adoption, the number of jobs, so in, in the United States, um, when we talk about energy being this big employer, what people don't really know is that efficiency is the largest employer in the energy sector. Efficiency is the employer that has over two million jobs in the US and expected to have another two million jobs if we do this right, that's us. Efficiency is the only, um, um, part of the sector that has jobs in, what is it, 96 to 97 counties in the United States. That means there's only seven counties in our country that does not have an energy efficiency job. And so really being able for people to understand that we have so much more to give and to drive this story and to reduce our use and our waste beyond just lowering our light bill, which is important, but it's lowering your gas bill. If you live in Maine and you have an oil burner, I used to have an oil burner earn oil heat. It is not fun when you're paying for something a gallon and it's five, $600 to build. Like all of that really, really matters. And efficiency is really, I think, the baseline. Yeah. Workforce opportunities, economic opportunities. Thank you for bringing that in. Yeah. Anybody else have a comment on this, you know, a, a theme of the COP and, as it should be and an implementation of the legislation at home and the IRA and the IIJA? is how do we make this transition just? How do we bring along communities? So uh, let, let's touch upon that in the last few minutes of, of the discussion. I could jump in on yeah. the, the financing side for that. I mean, thinking of the Inflation Reduction Act and also thinking more broadly here at COP, there's been a lot of talk about blended finance. So using private sector investment that goes alongside a more tailored or targeted mm -hmm. public sector, government agency, international financial institution, type investment. I think globally that's key to opening up markets and expanding the available pool of financing. But in terms of it within the U.S., I think of the green, uh, green banks, the greenhouse gas reduction fund that came out of IRA. There's a lot of opportunity to mobilize private sector investment to really get into underserved markets and use some of this blended finance concepts at home through different state level agencies to get at markets that need some type of catalyst. So I think it's maybe a little bit picking up on the points of coordination. It's thinking about what type of financing is available, needed, what can be done to mobilize that financing and incorporating that into the front end policy objectives because lots of times, and we see it a lot on the utility side, there's a lot of great thinking about technologies and the technical side and people race down the path of developing a project and then have to step back and think about how it's going to get funded. And it impacts the scope of what's possible, which impacts the benefits. Thank you. Others, transition. 
Yeah, I mean, if, uh, uh, you know, talking about jobs, I think, um, oh, sorry about that, thank you, Laura. Uh, so um, kind of talking about jobs, um, uh, we at Train Technologies, we're seeking kind of not the usual suspects uh, in, um, in, in our workforce development program. So uh, we seek to educate the communities around our factories, uh, where our manufacturing facilities, where um, we, want our, our, we want our workforce to look like our local community. And to achieve that goal, we do deep STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics education, uh, at very young levels, all the way up through school and in our communities. We also have a number of programs uh, around um, education, uh, like I said, for technicians. Uh, we have internal um, training uh, and, and programs uh, for, uh, for uh, employees as well as um, kind of workforce all the way through. And I, you know, I'm gonna say it now, Laura, instead of later. Uh, we don't have much more time, so go the, for it. The, this this kind of opportunity is a gateway. It's a gateway. Uh, technicians spin in and out of this world very, very quickly. Um, they come in, they're educated, they do a great job, and then they go on and do something else. It's a gateway to a better life for families. And um, so we think that this is really important. And even though we have to educate over and over, it's really a great opportunity for folks. Yeah. And I would just add, it's it's not just jobs, it's wealth. So it's about the ability to start a business, yeah. right? You don't have to um, be able to do, do, right, do HVAC mm -hmm. and work for Johnson Controls. You could actually work for yourself. And so when we think about um, disadvantaged communities, however you want, low income, however you want to describe it, um, why not encourage people to build for themselves where they are then able to hire their neighbors and other people in the community and really spread in a way um, and so oftentimes, not that good paying jobs are not good for people who live in low income, because they're fantastic, but they're allowed to dream bigger too. And there are a lot of people in those communities who actually don't want to work for somebody, they want to work for themselves. And so we actually provide an opportunity with a really low barrier to entry for people to be able to do that. And then to bring it back to the beginning when we talked about productivity, right? Yeah. If your home is not in a livable condition, it is really hard to do remote work. It is really hard to have a tech job. It is really hard to have your own business, right, without going to an office space. And, you know, just protect yourself and your family. So when we think about energy efficiency as this unifier, it's about the quality of a better life, whether that be from a job that you have, whether that be from, you know, not having your pipes freeze, not dying of heat stroke in your home. And I do believe that that is one of the biggest benefits of energy efficiency. And now we just have to think about how to get people over that upfront cost hurdle um, to make sure that everybody can adopt this technology. Bob's going to give him 400 million. <laughs> so in the last two minutes of this panel, I'm going to make up my own academic study. You're only going to remember what they say next in terms of what the main takeaway should be from their perspective of why energy efficiency is so critical to climate action and is a climate unifier. So, Bob, we're just going to go bing, bing, bing. Well, I think it speaks to the benefits. They're just so multifaceted that uh, it, it covers all ranges of economic. It covers all the greenhouse gas reductions that are needed here. And then it just gets into the lives of people, whether it's productivity or health. Um, you know, I, there's, there's different studies out looking at about the amount of, of annual deaths in the world worldwide. And 10% of them are due to air pollution and energy efficiency. Certainly there's a greenhouse gas reduction effect, but there's also the atmospheric pollutants that get reduced as well. So just across the board benefits any way you look, energy efficiency makes sense. Makes sense. So I would say energy efficiency is both a climate mitigation and climate adaptation unifier because it allows people to have a high quality of life in their homes. And it's really hard to have a good life if you don't have a home. There you go. And I would say efficiency is the one thing that we can all be involved in. And it does not matter where you live, what you make. Um, there's something that we can each do as it relates to that. So I think we're all saying the same thing, but I'll say it a different way. Um, energy efficiency um, puts money back in families' pockets. It uh, provides opportunities for people. Um, and, um, and it's great for the planet. Uh, so uh, it's kind of a win-win-win. So why wouldn't we support it and move it forward? Yeah. And what my takeaway from this discussion is I really think, I'm thinking of energy efficiency now as the con connective tissue 
of, of all of these elements, finance, technology, ec economy, um, your homes, your quality of life. So with that, thank you, panel. I'm so uh, really pleased for your time. We're gonna introduce um, our fireside chat next. So I'm gonna leave you in the good hands of Paula Glover at the Alliance to Save Energy. We'll welcome in uh, U.S. Deputy Secretary of Energy, Dave Turk, so hold the line. We're ready. Okay, great. Um, so, Dave, thank you so much. First of all, I know you've been running while you've been here. We really do appreciate you s spending some time with us. Um, we've just had a great conversation about why energy efficiency is a climate unifier. I'm hoping that's your message. Um, but let's get started. You know, there's been a lot going on at the federal level um, and a lot of investment in efficiency. Um, over the last three years through the Biden administration. Um, and so we're, we're really interested in is like, what role do you believe energy efficiency can play um, in achieving economy-wide decarbonization? And if you have examples of things that DOE is doing um, or success stories, please feel free to share those with us. Well, first of all, Paul, let me give a big thanks to you and your own personal leadership to Laura, our BCSE colleagues, um, certainly America all in as well. It's just terrific to be with you, uh, to be with you all. And uh, uh, completely agree uh, on a unifier, uh, not only for climate, but it's a no-brainer when it comes to costs, of course, as well, and saving the need to build additional infrastructure, right? If you do it more efficiently, you don't need to build that additional infrastructure. So to me, efficiency is the biggest no-brainer there is out there. Um, it's great that it's getting some attention at this climate conference, right? The doubling of energy efficiency is great. Uh, but what I'm even more uh, interested in seeing is how is everybody going to implement that? What are the plans? What are the tools? What are the financing mechanisms? Like, how do we actually implement energy efficiency at the scale uh, that we all need to, frankly, uh, both governments but also private sector uh, as well? Uh, buildings is such a huge part of the equation, as you know, and I don't need to tell those who focus on efficiency uh, on that front, my wife is actually a sustainable architect, so even when I come home at work, I get the pitch that we need to focus even more on buildings and do what we need to do to make sure our buildings are as efficient as they possibly can. Just in the U.S., 40% uh, of our emissions one way or another come from buildings. That's an awful lot of emissions, but it's also 30% energy wasted right now in terms of the lack of energy efficiency throughout our building space, new buildings, but also existing buildings as well. And the estimate, to go back to your point, it's not only a climate no-brainer, it's a money no-brainer, no is $100 billion of a cost per year that's wasted, right? That's $100 billion we could be investing in all sorts of other ways than just literally losing it because our buildings aren't as efficient uh, as they can be, as they need to be. So we're doing an awful lot uh, at the department to answer uh, your question to implement, to actually do these kinds of things in the real, uh, the real world. We've got tax incentives of all different kinds, uh, we've got rebates that will be coming out very soon, which is really exciting to make sure consumers can benefit from all these energy efficient appliances, but also look at home retrofits up to $14,000. That's a big deal. Uh, and they're even more generous for low income folks to make sure that everyone benefits from these uh, technologies that we've got uh, out there. I'm pleased to announce in particular that we've got uh, a new U.S. national building strategy. Right, so we've got all these tools, but what's the strategy? How does it all fit together? So we're releasing this national strategy with some uh, very ambitious goals, rightfully so, in terms of what we need to be doing in the U.S. So by 2050, just to give you a few, a few numbers of what we're, again, not just having targets, but how do we achieve those? Uh, my good friend Jeff Rudian, who's the head of our energy efficiency and renewables team, is in charge of uh, implementing all this. So thank you, Jeff, in advance of reaching these goals. I'm not sure Jeff will be in charge of ERE for the full entirety to 2050, but at least for the time that he is in charge of ERE. 
So just to give you a few numbers, uh, we're looking to reduce our on-site energy intensity 50% uh, by that 2050 time period. And one thing, we talk about 2050 sometimes in a net zero context as if that's like some future far off land. Like 2050 is, uh, what, we're 2023, almost 2024. That's 26 years from now. So we've got an awful lot of work to get to that 50% on the on-site energy intensity. Uh, we're looking to reduce our on-site emissions 75%. And one thing I'm particularly proud of is reducing our embodied emissions 90%, right? All the concrete, all the steel. That is a big deal. That is a big part of the building's uh, efficiency opportunity going, uh, going forward. So I encourage you all to take a look at the strategy. Of course, these are meant to be living strategies with feedback so that we can all work together to achieve these uh, kinds of ambitious goals. Well, I'm, look, I'm excited to hear that you guys have this strategy in place, particularly given the pledge that's just been made, because without the strategy in place, then we, you would really be hustling to 2030 to meet those goals. Um, so tell us, uh, sticking with this theme around strategies, like how do we ensure that these benefits are going to reach those people who need it the most, our most disadvantaged, low-income communities? How, how do you do that? So you do it by being intentional and purposeful and really leveraging the tools that you've got. Um, I am incredibly proud to be part of this administration, this Biden-Harris administration, for a number of reasons. One part uh, that makes me particularly proud is it's not good enough for us to do our part to save the planet from climate change, uh, but we need to make sure as we go through this energy transition, we take advantage of these energy efficiency opportunities, that the benefits apply to everybody, and uh, especially to those, uh, and we're in an informal setting here, who've gotten screwed in the past, right? People, communities who've gotten screwed in the past. It's morally the right thing to do, but it's also the right thing to do to make sure that we've got everybody's buy-in, everybody's support, so that we can have the kinds of investments that we need to going forward. So one thing the president has done, and we're living and breathing it every day at the Department of Energy, is Justice 40, right? So when we have programs, 40% of those benefits go to, again, people who've gotten screwed in the past and uh, doing the right thing uh, and doing it in a very intentional, purposeful uh, kind of way. I mentioned the rebates before. Uh, the rebates are designed and our team working on the rebates and Jeff's team is part of that uh, team along with our newly renamed. We uh, have a new office, newly renamed office, but it's been greatly expanded called our Energy Justice and Equity Office, right? Again, being purposeful, intentional for those who know uh, Shalonda Baker, she's the head of that office. We've got phenomenal colleagues in that team. Again, trying to make sure we're doing this kind of uh, justice throughout, including on the efficiency side. So the rebates, uh, that's $10 billion of taxpayer funding going to have these energy efficient appliances, whether it's heat pumps, home retrofits, all accessible and even more accessible to those who uh, can least afford it, but who need it the most in terms of reducing their energy burden uh, so they can spend their money on education and other kinds of, uh, kinds of things along those lines. We've got our energy efficiency and conservation block grants. That's another $440 million. That's a big amount of money, again, for states, communities to do the right uh, thing. The other piece I'd like to flag is something that's not gotten as much attention, but I think will get an awful lot more attention as we really implement this uh, at scale throughout our department. When you get money from the federal government, if you're a private sector or if you're a community, you need to do a community benefits plan. You need to show how that taxpayer funding is actually benefiting the community in which you are living, in which you are working. Uh, and that is a big deal that that's a requirement. Uh, and it will be a legally binding requirement as we get to the stage where we're actually giving federal money out. Again, that's purposeful, that's intentional, that's how you've got to deal with these kinds of issues. So we're at a global conference and we know we only have one planet. So we're actually, we cannot do this alone as the U.S. and think that we'll survive and everybody else isn't going to make it. Um, as you guys have been pushing out these investments over the last several years, what are some things that you've learned that you might be able to share with other countries um, so that as they go on their paths, they're not making some of the mistakes that we may have made? Yeah, so the first thing I've learned is um, have some humility. As much as we like to think we're really smart at the department, are we smart at the department, Jeff? We're very smart <laughs> at the Department of Energy. We've got a lot of nerds, including 17 national labs. Uh, phenomenal talent. We've actually hired now uh, 800 plus new people to come in and do all these new programs with these historic pieces of legislation. 
but as smart as we think we are, and I think as cutting edge as some of our programs are, approach it with a sense of humility. There's a lot of countries doing an awful lot of really interesting things, including in the efficiency space. Uh, I was on a panel yesterday with a good friend of mine, Ajay Mathur, uh, who is now the head of the International Solar Alliance. He used to be the head of the Bureau of Energy Efficiency in the Indian government, and routinely impressed with how India does energy efficiency. Uh, they did LEDs at scale like no other country did in the world, and they drove costs down that other countries benefited from. So I think there's an awful lot we can learn uh, from others uh, as well. The few pieces that I think from the U.S. side I'm particularly proud about that I think people can learn from is one, there's still a lot of innovation we can do in efficiency, right? We know we've got a lot of tools, we've got a lot of techniques, we've got heat pumps, we've got all sorts of other uh, uh, tried and true cost-effective measures, but it doesn't mean we can't innovate even further. We've launched a series of what we've called energy earth shots, which are meant to be where are the key areas where if we reduce costs even further, we can achieve our climate objectives, we can get to net zero throughout our economies. The eighth and final, and I think one of the most impressive of those, I was just talking to Jeff and it sounds like there's getting a lot of attention, which is great at this climate conference, is our affordable home energy shot, which is very much meant to be an equity innovation shot with affordable housing to make sure that we are doing everything in our labs to drive costs down to make these technologies available at bigger scale and bigger impact. So the goal of that Earthshot, these are all ambitious goals, uh, is to have uh, efficiency upgrade costs in affordable housing uh, reduced by half. So uh, with just a relatively short amount of time, we're talking decadal time periods here, if we're successful on that, that's going to reduce the energy costs of people who live in affordable housing by 25%, right? So that's just one example of what we're doing. Set those goals, have the plans to implement those goals, uh, lean in on the innovation side. And then the second piece is there's all sorts of partnerships um, that you can learn in a, in a mutual way. We've got bilateral partnerships, including, as I mentioned, with India, but countries around the world develop, developing. Uh, but we also have a number of multilateral platforms for energy efficiency. Uh, in some ways, there's too many to name. Maybe we need to consolidate and have more streamline in some of that. But there's an awful lot of good forums and an awful lot of people doing a lot of work. I suspect there are many in the room here today and listening to us online who are working in these multilateral platforms to all learn from each other and uh, do what we need to do, just do it faster and bolder and at bigger scale. We're just about out of time. I'm going to ask you one question that you didn't see before, but I think you can. We're going to. I'm softballing you. <laughs> um, you have here about 25 to 30 advocates and friends. What is that thing that we should be walking out of this room either thinking about, but no action? What should we be walking out of this room planning to do as it relates to efficiency? So, uh, to me, it's all about execution and implementation. Right, goal setting is great. I think we've got a doubling now of energy efficiency uh, on the table. Uh, do we implement, do we execute? And the earlier we implement, the earlier we execute, the better we are. Our secretary is always stressing to us uh, narratives and stories, right? If we have some good narratives and stories, sharing those, getting others excited about the potential and the opportunity. So I say, let's roll up our sleeves, let's implement. If countries don't have good plans to actually implement, like let's hold their feet to the fire, right? It's not good enough to have a goal if you don't actually do the work to, uh, to implement. And that's where the expertise of folks like these in the room are so important to hold everyone accountable to actually implement. If you don't think our US strategy is up to the task, let us know. If our building strategy is not as rigorous as it needs to be, this is where we need to have that back and forth. But holding us all accountable implementing and then really telling those stories, the narratives in ways that, you know, we need to break through to the uh, folks who are not energy efficiency advocates if we're going to be successful uh, on this uh, shared effort. Well, that's about time, Dave. Thank you so much. Thank you. We really do appreciate you having you here. And we certainly at the Alliance look forward to further engagement with you, Jeff, and everyone at DOE, EPA, whoever's on board around efficiency. Thank per you. Perfect. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everybody.